Hello, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you to LEAD Center's webinar on Section 188, Equal Opportunity and Accessibility for WIOA, also known as Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, Partners During COVID-19 and Beyond. For those of you who may be new to the LEAD Center, LEAD is the WIOA Policy Development Center. LEAD stands for Leadership for the Employment and Economic Advancement of People with Disabilities. And the LEAD Center is led by Social Policy Research Associates and National Disability Institute and is funded by the Office of Disability Employment Policy at the U.S. Department of Labor. Next slide, please. This product has been funded either wholly or in part with federal funds from the U.S. Department of Labor Office of Disability Employment Policy. The contents of this publication do not necessarily reflect the views or policies of the Department of Labor, nor does mention of trade names, commercial products, or organizations imply endorsement of same by the U.S. government. Recipients should review the Civil Rights Center web materials and 29 CFR Part 38 to better understand their legal obligations. These slides and a recording and transcript of this webinar will be posted on the LEAD Center's website at www. At, I'm sorry, www.leadcenter.org. Next slide, please. So that everyone can fully participate in today's webinar, we'd like to take a moment to share some captioning and housekeeping tips. Today's webinar is captioned. The caption will appear below the slide deck. You also have the option to open the captioning webpage in a new browser. The link has been posted in the chat box. You can adjust the background color text, color, and font using the drop-down menus at the top of the browser. Position the window to sit on top of the embedded captioning. We do want to hear from you and encourage you to ask questions during today's presentation. We will have an opportunity at the end for questions and answers. Select the button with a speech bubble icon to submit your questions throughout the presentation. If you are experiencing any technical issues or have questions for the technical support team, open the participant list and select the raise hand button next to your name. Next slide, please. My name is Laura Glenick, and I will be serving as the moderator for today's webinar. And to kick off our presentation today, we're, we're really happy to have Jennifer Sheehy with us. She is the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Officer, Office of Disability Employment Policy at the U.S. Department of Labor. The mission of the Office of Disability Employment Policy, also known as ODEP, is to develop policy that increases job opportunities for youth and adults with disabilities. Prior to her current position, Jennifer spent 10 years at the U.S. Department of Education in many roles, including Acting Director of the National Institute on Disability and Rehabilitation Research, Acting Deputy Commissioner of the Rehabilitation Services Administration and Special Assistant to the Assistant Secretary of the Office of Special Education and Rehabilitative Services. Jennifer came to the Department of Education from the Presidential Task Force on Employment of Adults with Disabilities, where she was Senior Policy Advisor and served a detail as Assistant Director in the White House Domestic Policy Council. Before she joined the task force staff, Jennifer was Vice President of the National Organization on Disability and of its CEO Council. Again, Jennifer, thank you for being with us today, and I'd like to turn it over to you. Thank you, Laura. It's so nice to join you, and I am watching the number of participants 
rise rapidly. We have more than 390 individuals um, listening and participating in this webinar today. And I, I just wanna thank you all very, very much. Um, as Laura said, I'm with the U.S. Department of Labor's Office of Disability Employment Policy, or ODEP as we refer to it. And um, the fact that you are spending this time with us today is particularly important because we know that you have many, many uh, challenges and uh, activities that are demanding your attention. And so this is obviously something, a topic you care about um, as much or uh, as we care about the accessibility of programs and services for people with disabilities in the workforce system. So I, I hope that your families are also staying safe and healthy at this time. We at ODEP and the Department of Labor definitely appreciate, some, appreciate the many ways that your daily lives are changing um, to ensure that your families and communities are healthy during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I do encourage you to check out some of the resources that our technical assistance centers have created at this time to help individuals and the families and I urge you to look at our website, which is dol.gov, dol.gov slash ODEP to learn more. There are many resources, including those from the CDC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, our um, amazing job accommodation network and others. And hopefully you would find those helpful. Today, we do have a webinar that should be informative as um, that's hosted by the National Center on Leadership for the Employment and Economic Advancement of People with Disabilities, or as we refer to it, the LEAD Center. And you heard Laura talk about that. We will be taking a deep dive into Section 188 of the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. Workforce professionals and those such as yourselves have an essential and actually in some cases a life-saving role right now to play during the pandemic. Ensuring that people with disabilities have access to your services will help limit the impact of the economic situation for people with disabilities. You can really help people stay at work through these challenging times or train them for new roles and responsibilities that may become available um, should their businesses be impacted um, severely by the pandemic. And you can help them find new opportunities for career growth. So today's webinar, we will be joined by uh, people and professionals from the Missouri workforce system and we uh, will use, they're going to use scenarios from the front line to share effective accommodation practices and policies, procedures, implementation. We hope this um, webinar will provide actual practical ideas that you can implement yourselves to ensure equal opportunity for people with disabilities in your own state. I also want to take the opportunity to mention a very important anniversary this year. ODEP is working on a series of events and resources to commemorate the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act, or the ADA, which was signed into law in July of 1990, as you know. The ADA is a civil rights law that has positively benefited countless Americans with disabilities. It prohibits discrimination against people with disabilities in all areas of life, including employment. And its purpose is to make sure that people with disabilities have the same rights and opportunities and the playing field is level for them um, as, and, and they are able to enjoy the freedom, the uh, responsibilities, and the meaning of work just like anyone else. We invite you to learn more about the ADA and how to recognize this 
milestone at ODEP's website. Again, that's col.gov, gov slash ODEP. Now, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Laura and our webinar speakers to tell us more about Section 188 of WIOA and how you can best support workers with disabilities in your state. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Sir Jen. Thank you, Jennifer. Next slide, please. Um, thank you for the opening words, Jennifer, and the relevance of today's webinar and the reminder of the importance of the ADA as we look to celebrate its 30th anniversary. So building on what Jennifer shared, we have three learning objectives for today's webinar. We will be providing a review of WIOA Section 188 with a focus on programmatic accessibility. We're going to learn about effective equal opportunity policies and procedures around disability disclosure and reasonable accommodations, and explore equal opportunity and accessibility scenarios during COVID-19, including accommodations for people with disabilities and workforce professionals. Next slide, please. This is the second webinar in a two-part series to provide information, strategies, and resources around Section 188's Equal Opportunity and Non-Discrimination Practices. The first part in this series, Statewide Cross-System Training on WIOA Section 188, Broadening Access for People with Disabilities and Other Barriers to Employment featured representatives from Virginia's Equal Opportunity Office, WIOA Adult and Dislocated Worker Programs, and Department for Aging and Rehabilitative Services. And today's webinar features representatives from Missouri. Uh, as Jennifer had shared, our speakers all have leadership and on-the-ground experience and expertise that they bring to today's presentation. It really is my pleasure to introduce you to them now. And I'm going to start with my colleague, Jamie Robinson, who is a financial empowerment and workforce manager and a member of National Training Training and Technical Assistance Team at National Disability Institute. Jamie specializes in workforce systems change with a focus on integrating equal opportunity and financial capability strategies into service delivery systems. And she has been working for several years with the other presenters from Missouri. Danielle Smith is the State of Missouri WIOA Equal Opportunity Officer. Danielle has worked for the Department of Higher Education and Workforce Development since 2006. Prior to becoming the state WIOA Equal Opportunity Officer, Danielle was Regional Coordinator for the Division of Workforce Development, where she managed and administered Missouri Job Center programs. Danielle first started her career in Kansas City, Missouri as a teacher. She later entered into the human resources field in Tulsa, Oklahoma, which led her back to Kansas City, Missouri, where she has worked for private and government organizations in workforce services for over 20 years. And finally, uh, Yvonne Wright has devoted more than 26 years to the area of workforce development. Yvonne is currently the Senior Manager of Policy and Partnerships for the Office of Workforce Development, where she is located under the new Department of Higher Education and Workforce Development. Prior to coming to the Office of Workforce Development, Yvonne served as the Director of Business Outreach and Workforce Development for the Missouri Division of Vocational Rehabilitation. In her role, Yvonne works closely with Director Hardy Leathers to oversee the provision of job seeker services provided by Missouri's public workforce system. Really want to thank all of you for being with us today. And Janie, I'm going to turn the presentation over to you to help get us started. Great. Thank you, Laura and Jennifer. Next slide, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's really great to be here with you all alongside my Missouri colleagues today. Um, I'm going to start by 
um, just going, giving you a review of some of the key elements of WIOA Section 188 to help us kind of all get on the same page. And then I'll pass it over to the Missouri team and they will kind of get into how does this apply to state and local workforce systems. And they'll also talk about some of the strategies and the practices that they're using not only to meet 188 compliance, but you know, how are they operationalizing policies? How are they looking to partnerships? Uh, how do they keep such a co close pulse um, on accessibility? Um, and how are they working to ensure people with disabilities are reaching uh, employment outcomes? So Section 188 of WIOA implements the non-discrimination and equal opportunity provisions for workforce services, activities, and programs. Uh, Section 188 prohibits discrimination um, on the basis of all of these diversity bases, race, color, religion, sex, which also includes pregnancy, childbirth, and related medical conditions. It also includes transgender status and gender identity age, disability, political affiliation or belief, national origin, including uh, limited English proficiency, and citizenship status. Uh, here is a link to Section 188 for your reference for more information. Next slide, please. So under Section 188, um, AJC programs are required to provide reasonable accommodations for individuals with disabilities to ensure equal access and opportunity. And reasonable accommodation is defined as a modification or an adjustment in the way the program is administered that enables an individual with a disability to receive any aid, benefit, service, training, or employment equal to those provided to individuals without disabilities. So let's pause there, talk a little bit about that. When an AJC is assisting a job seeker who voluntarily discloses a disability, um, and we're gonna talk a little bit later about how people disclose, right? Because lots of people don't necessarily use the term disability or accommodation, right? But when a disclosure happens, um, that really should prompt the AJC to consider, you know, how can we work together with um, that job seeker to identify, are there any accommodations that are needed? And if so, how can we move quickly um, and, and in a timely way um, to help that individual to access services and, and make sure there's not a delay? And the third bullet there, this is really important because AJCs really need to not only have the written policies explaining the obligations to make those accommodations, but it's just as important for AJC staff and partners too, and customers to understand what's the process involved um, to move quickly in a timely manner, right? A quick example of an AJC um, and the importance of kind of having both that written policy and the process in place could be an individual who has a visual impairment asks, you know, do you have any adaptive technology in your resource room? And here's the thing, lots of AJCs do have now, they do have various types of AT available, adaptive technology, but not everyone knows what they have. Not all the staff knows uh, what they have, how it works, where it is, right? So this is kind of an example, yep, we have an accommodation policy. We even have the accommodation that's being requested, but we don't know where it is, how to access it and how to get the customer to it. Um, the last bullet there, you'll see in limited circumstances, the AJC programs may not be required to provide a specific reasonable accommodation if it can establish that making modifications would cause an undue hardship for the AJC program. So accommodations are going to depend on each situation, right? So if you look at another example of a deaf job seeker um, and assume, okay, the AJC has the policy in place, they know how to secure an interpreter, right? The individual comes in, he's deemed eligible for a training program that's months long. Who provides the interpreters, right? Who pays for the interpreters for that program? And that's going to depend on each situation, right? But 
undue hardship might come into play there. Um, however, this is a good opportunity for the AJC and the trading provider to look into partnership. And specifically with Voc Rehab, um, if that customer is amenable to that, um, to leverage the cost of interpreters throughout that training program. So this is a situation that many of us have seen in the field. Um, it's happening, that level of collaboration. Um, so it's just really important to think about, explore partnerships, look into options when a cost of accommodation might seem, you know, not doable. Um, really don't, don't be quick to, to say no, really look into those partnerships. Next slide. So who does Section 188 apply to? Well, the recipients are defined as any entity to which financial assistance under WIOA Title I is extended. And it includes state level agencies that administer or are financed by WIOA Title I funds, state employment security agencies, state and local workforce um, development boards, uh, one-stop job center operators, service providers, including eligible training providers, OJT employers, Job Corps contractors, and programs and activities that are part of the one-stop delivery system that are operated by one-stop partners. And that one is pretty important, that last bullet, because any program or activity that touches the AJC will need to have a level of awareness of 188, right, and the EO practices. And that's gonna probably fall on workforce staff and EO officers to help educate those partners and programs, including training providers. We know EO uh, officers are going out and talking to training providers, employers. I know this because Missouri does it. <laughs> and, and they've talked to me about it. Next slide, please. Um, if you haven't heard of this resource yet, and you want to understand 188 more in terms of what's the everyday practices that people are using to comply, but also um, that are effective, right? This is an invaluable resource. It's called Promising Practices in Achieving Non-Discrimination and Equal Opportunity, a Section 188 Disability Reference Guide. Um, and this was jointly developed by the Civil Rights Center, also by the Office of Disability Employment Policy with support and assistance from um, the LEAD Center uh, with the National Disability Institute where I work. Um, and the promising practices in this guide directly correlate with all of the non-discrimination equal opportunity requirements of 188. So what you can see is lots of different ways. You know, there's not just one way. There's lots of different strategies that workforce systems can use to comply, but also to improve access and help people get to their employment, reach, you know, their goals. Um, it is important to note that the guide doesn't create new legal requirements. It doesn't change current legal requirements. Um, the promising practices that are in there, you know, they don't preclude states and, and recipients for thinking about new approaches. We're always talking to the field and, and getting more uh, strategies, and, and we did update um, that 188 guide, too, and I'm sure that's something that'll be an ongoing process. Um, but also adopting these promising practices will not, will not guarantee compliance, right? But we do know that these strategies are being used across the country, and we know they're expanding access, and we know they're, you know, leading to better uh, improved employment opportunities. Next slide, please. So when we talk about accessibility under WIOA Section 188, we are talking about physical and programmatic accessibility. All WIOA Title I financially assisted programs and activities must be both physically and programmatically accessible. So again, you're looking at reasonable accommodations and not only to your practices, but to policies too. Just uh, spoke with uh, a state 
uh, around policies that were really prohibiting being able to secure interpreters because they were only looking at interpreters that were in their system. They had to be in their system and they weren't able to fill those requests. So they had to take a look at their policy. How do we change that policy so we can fill these accommodation requests? Um, administering programs in the most integrated setting. I mean, that means, are you serving people with all different disabilities? Right, if someone came in who um, said, you know, I'm working with a group of, of youth who have um, autism, sure. Come on in. I'll let you. I'll show you the resource room. I'll show you the. You know what? What everybody gets here. You know the job leads. Um, all of those core services. So really, just welcoming all people, um, communicating with individuals with disabilities as effectively with others. Right. Providing those auxiliary aids, the assistive technology, um, anything that really ensures that. People with disabilities are getting equal opportunity to participate in and enjoy the benefits of the program or activity. And that's bolded because, you know, it's not just about getting in the door, right? Okay, you can get to the computer, you can use the computer, you can get some job leads programs, but enjoying the benefits. And you all can define what that means to you. But for some, it could mean reaching, you know, their employment goal, getting a job, right? And so those are the types of things that you're looking at when you're looking at program accessibility all along that customer flow of your AJC. The last, def uh, last bullet um, describes how the 188 definition of programmatic accessibility is actually more encompassing. It's broader um, than the ADA program accessibility. In fact, programmatic is actually a WIOA term. So it's even more encompassing than the ADA uh, program accessibility, and it requires one stop to ensure equal access uh, for individuals with disabilities from policy to practice. Next slide, please. So discussing disability, uh, you know, from my experience being on the workforce side of staff, be working in the Massachusetts AJCs, um, and then before that, um, more from a disability partner lens, um, formally coordinating an employment program for the deaf community, both roles I experienced myself, other staff, other partners, and customers not really understanding why AJCs might discuss disability. And so there's a lot of kind of, um, you know, just why would it come up? Why would you discuss it? You know, how is it being discussed? And so the first bullet here is really important um, for everybody to, you know, understand that state workforce systems collect and maintain records that include race, ethnicity, sex, age, and where known, right? So that would be disclosure, disability status of every applicant, registrant, participant, applicant for employment, and employee. So this data is paramount for workforce systems to demonstrate they are serving people with disabilities, right? And under WIOA, were promised disaggregated data on not only how many people with disabilities are you serving, but what services are they getting? Are they making it into different programs that you have, your training, maybe your apprenticeship, maybe career pathways? Are they getting uh, jobs and for how long, right? So that's really an important understanding for everybody to have. This is a collection of information that has to be reported on. But I think, um, it, you know, keep in mind that AJCs do collect it differently, right? Some through the computer systems, some on paper, some orally. But AJCs do need to have, you know, written policies for staff regarding the legal requirements related to disclosure of a customer's disability. And for example, having that policy um, would help, you know, a staff to know if a customer voluntarily initiates discussion around a disability, 
then agencies can inform them of reasonable accommodation policies and procedures if they might need it, right? And they should inform them that there's strict confidentiality regulations. And there's also limitations on who can access the information. So there's a lot that kind of needs to happen in terms of informing a customer um, as, uh, you know, disability is initiated by a customer and, and disclosed. Next slide, please. In recognizing disclosure, we know that people with disabilities, um, again, might not come into an AJ and say, I have a disability, or at some point say, I need an accommodation. That's just not a common terms that you hear, right? Um, I mean, some people will. <laughs> you definitely have some people who will come in, you know, I'll just go to a deaf job seeker, will say, listen, I need an interpreter. Um, it does happen, but it's not common, you know? And what we hear in the field is that people tend, customers and job seekers tend to make their way through the customer flow and disclose, disclose a little later on, you know, or maybe when there's a, a roadblock, um, uh, maybe a need to ask for some support. I mean, we all tend, all of us may talk about our symptoms or illness, or, you know, maybe we mention diabetes or that we've had anxiety or a back problem, or, you know, maybe we've shared that, yeah, we've, re you know, got a little special help in school. But think, there are just many different ways that we all describe um, experiences related to disability. So AJCs and, and the partners really want to consider when job seekers are initiating these conversations, ah, are, they, are they making a request for an accommodation? Are they asking for supports or resources? Um, and so that might be, that's, you know, the time to explore that. And it also might be a good time to consider relaying information about programs like vocational rehabilitation. And we're not talking about uh, automatic referral, that's a problem, right? Um, but it is important to remember that as workforce professionals, you may not know all of the resources and the tools that people will need in order to reach their employment. Um, they might not know, right? So it becomes about giving uh, all of the tools for them to choose and also thinking about uh, options between the service systems, you know, where could maybe we look to do some partnering? How could we work together with VR or other programs, right? Um, and this is happening all across the country. Lots of programs are co-enrolling and leveraging resources where AJCs can help people maybe get into the training or secure an OJT. And VR or another agency is providing job coaching, maybe adaptive technology, maybe some travel training, and other supports. Next slide, please. So here are just a few things to remember as customers disclose and as your AJCs collect information around disability. Um, you know, you'd want to relay that it's voluntary, it's confidential, right? What they describe might be considered a disability and supports might be available. Are they interested in that? If accommodations are needed to access services or training or a job, they can be explored and, and implemented. And then you all uh, know where to go for those types of resources and, and assistance and help. And we'll talk more about that too. And if customers choose, AJCs could engage VR or um, other partners. And it's, it's underlined and bolded there because, um, you know, people don't want to kind of just be referred, you know, out. Oh, you have a disability, go here. You know, it's now a lot of AJCs are saying, hey, do you want to work together um, with this individual? They're interested in learning about VR, but they also are very interested in our services here. Could we think about coming together as a group and, and talking about working together? And that is already happening nationally. 
Um, and then customers must give permission to um, document their disability. Um, they have the choice, right? Um, and some will say, no, I don't want that to be documented, right? Because some people have had not good experiences around that, and that's okay. And I have to tell you, I've had a lot of talks with Missouri over the years, and I can hear Danielle saying, you know, if, even if someone says, no, you can't document it, and the person needs accommodations, and you still move forward. You keep moving forward. That doesn't stop the process. Next slide. So just a few other tips to keep in mind. Um, you want your staff to have some processes in place to recognize and discuss and think about and how do they implement accommodations, right? Um, it's not about proactively questioning people about disability um, or, or seeking information about a disability that hasn't been disclosed. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about preparing and training staff to, oh, I, that could be uh, disclosing. I'm, I'm recognizing that. I'm, I'm knowing how to do that now. Somebody's talking about symptoms, illness, all these different ways. And are they requesting an accommodation in plain English, but not using those, those words disability and accommodation? And then also feeling staff kind of feeling more comfortable in being able to uh, be in that situation and work with people with individuals who do disclose um, instead of kind of uh, pausing that uh, or halting um, the service flow. The last bullet there, we owe staff should understand policies and processes behind this mandated statement. So all of you are very familiar uh, with this statement that Job Center's Equal Opportunity Employer does not discriminate, auxiliary aids are available, but what does that mean, right? <laughs> um, and it means having a clear understanding of your reasonable accommodation policy, but more importantly, when someone makes a request, you can recognize they are, right? And you know how to move forward because there's lots of simple requests and there's, there's some that are more complicated, right? So how do you, how empowered, is, you know, are you to, you know, keep that going so people can get the accommodation if they need it in a timely manner? Uh, next slide, please. So we know that an automatic referral to VR of a customer who discloses or presents with a disability is considered discrimination. Um, and with that, you know, giving a job seeker who has voluntarily disclosed information um, about, you know, potential resources, potential tools that they might need or want and that are available to that, them, it becomes all about, you know, their choice, right? And when discuss, customers disclose or present with disabilities, again, do not halt service flow. Continue to engage through services, outreach uh, your partners, and research, research your research, resources. I mean, unfortunately, this does happen to customers. There's this issue around like not knowing what accommodation could be explored or implemented. And it's not just by staff, it's also by the customer, some customers. Um, and so instead of reaching out to partners, there's just this kind of stop that happens and the customer doesn't move forward because no one really knows how to hire the interpreter, who's gonna pay for it. <laughs> um, so the important thing here is to really connect with your colleagues, do some brainstorming, connect with your VR colleagues, um, use resources like the Job Accommodation Network, in your ADA centers, and think about solutions with other people, you know, and um, you don't have to know, uh, you know, all the answers, um, but you do need to have a process where to go to look for answers. Um, and you know what, I find that others who are also really interested and passionate about helping people to find work uh, will be your allies in this and really want to help you uh, find solutions. Next slide, please. 
Okay, great. So I am going to um, pass it over to my colleague, Danielle Smith, and she will uh, give you a much more closer kind of state lens on 188. Danielle? Thanks, Jamie. I first want to thank the Department of Labor and the LEAD Center for coordinating this platform and allowing Missouri to showcase their work towards Section 188. I also want to thank Dr. Uh, Director Marty Leathers for allowing me to, the opportunity to speak about how Missouri is providing equal access in our workforce system for our customers. Next slide, please. So today I would like to discuss Section 88, Telework and Virtual Services. I want people to know that uh, Section 188 covers employees too, and Section 188 has the same obligations if, if you're teleworking or if you're providing services virtually. Section 188 also provides a blueprint for equal access to services for participants, employees, and the general public. So working from home requires the, that you have access to electronic information, communication with others in a remote way, and electronic devices. And the employers may provide the employee with a laptop computer, a cell phone, or other equipment that's needed to conduct work from an alternate location. Next slide, slide please. So reasonable accommodations may include the following, but it's not limited to a change to the application or a hiring process, a change to the way a job is done, or it could be that it, it's a change to the work or the training environment. So an accommodation are considered reasonable if they do not create an undue hardship or a direct threat. And you can find more information, more information about reasonable accommodations at 29 CFR.14 and 2938.4P. Uh, Thank you. Next slide. So reasonable accommodations. Examples would be a change to a, a job task, flexibility in a work schedule, or it could be that um, providing aids or services to increase access to um, a, a, a job duty, or it could be that um, you need a, a change in the presentation or training material, or you may need a special equipment or a special software to do your job. So those are examples of reasonable accommodations. Next slide, please. I want to talk about Section 188 obligations as a condition to the award of financial assistance from the Department of Labor under WIOA. The grant applicant or the recipient must assure that it has the ability to comply with the non-discrimination and equal opportunity provision. So some of these obligations include, but it's not limited to, ensuring that you post on your website the state and local EO officer's name, position, title, email, mailing address, and the telephone number, and voice, and TDD, TTY. And you can find more information at 29 CFR 38.29 regarding this topic. Next slide, please. It's very important, could you go back one slide, please? Thank you. It's very important to post the EO officer and the local EO officer's information because we have to assist our customers with processing complaints and, and that complaint procedure and policy should be posted on your website. And that's, you can find more information regarding complaint procedure requirements at 29 CFR 38.72 and 38.73. The equal opportunity notice poster should be posted on your website in appropriate languages. The EO poster, notice poster provides 
customers, uh, participants, employees, and the general public their right to file a discrimination complaint under uh, Section 188. And so it's very important that that information is posted on your website. So the EO tagline is also a requirement for WIOA recipients, and this should be posted on brochures, flyers, public service announcements, anything that's advertising or um, marketing the out of the program's services, um, activities that are offered in the American Job Center. So your EO tag line should be posted on your website as well. And then all other appropriate information under the uh, non-discrimination plan, and you can find a list of those things, and you can find that at 29 CFR 38.54, but uh, Section 188 requires a lot of inf uh, a lot of things that uh, state workforce, the state workforce system should have um, to make sure that they're in compliance with Section 188. So each governor must establish, implement a non-discrimination plan for states, and each non-discrimination plan must be designed to give a reasonable guarantee that all recipients will comply and are complying with the non-discrimination and equal opportunity provisions under Section 188 of WIOA. The non-discrimination plan should be posted on your website because anyone should have access to the non-discrimination plan. And I think I need to go back one more slide. Thank you. So another obligation, some other obligations under Section 188 is ensuring the website is consistent with accessibility standards, such as Section 508 standards. You can find more information at 36 CFR Part 1194 and um, W3C's Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, and you can find more information at 29 CFR 3815. But we want to make sure that our websites are accessible. When websites and tools are properly properly designed and coded, people with disabilities can, can use them. But when a website has accessibility barriers, it makes it difficult or impossible for people with disabilities to use and access um, services. So we want to make sure that the website is accessible so it can benefit everyone. The Babel Notice or other LEP requirements that is, you can find under 29 CFR 38.9. The Babel Notice is a short notice included in your documents or electronic communications such as your website, um, if you have some type of app. It should be included in email, and it also should be available in multiple languages, informing the reader that communication contains vital information. The Babel Notice also explains how to access language services to have the contents of the communication provided in other languages. So all WIOA recipients are required to take reasonable steps to provide language assistance. And of course, what we've been talking about today is, is reasonable accommodation modification. And you can find more information at 29 CFR 38.14. But a recipient must provide reasonable accommodations to qualified individuals with disabilities who are, who are participating in our program services or activities. And as I stated before, this also applies to employees and applicants for employment, unless the uh, providing the accommodation would cause an undue hardship. Next slide. Next slide. Okay. So now I'm going to turn it over to Yvonne Wright who is my coworker, who will provide some scenarios uh, regarding 
virtual services and the things that we've done in Missouri. Thank you very much, Danielle. And I have to also say what an honor and a privilege it is to speak on behalf of Missouri and uh, really appreciate the guidance of our leadership at uh, the Office of Workforce Development in Missouri. Dr. Leathers has been very supportive of all our efforts. So um, I wanted to let you know that what we're going to discuss next is kind of some, hopefully some real life examples. And so what I'm going to do is first of all, address a little bit of how we have responded to COVID-19 in regard to section 188 and, and, and opening up and trying to continue to provide that programmatic and physical accessibility for, for everyone. Then I'm gonna take a deeper look into how we've addressed some of those accommodations. And as Danielle mentioned, and Jamie did as well, how those affect both staff and the customers that we serve. And then I'm just gonna give you a quick broad perspective of what we're doing statewide in Missouri to try to um, open our doors and be more um, uh, accessible, uh, act, having uh, access for individuals with disabilities, even in, in looking for state jobs. So quick disclaimer, I would like to tell you that we have all the answers. We don't have all the answers. Um, I would say what makes us, um, you know, willing is that we are there because we want to know the answers. And we're always willing to seek out the answers and try to grow and learn, and most importantly, share and learn from each other in the process. So I would say what our strength has been is our willingness to reach out and to get answers if we don't have them. So um, on my first slide, which has been brought up, I wanted to talk a little bit about our responsiveness to COVID-19. And I'll talk a little bit about the policy. We have made some changes in policy. Um, I wanted to give you a few examples of what those look like. We have um, uh, provided flexibility to our uh, dislocated worker policy so that eligibility is, is more flexible and open to customers that may have a callback date in this in this time, we have just had to be inventive and try to look for new ways to, um, to bring more people into our system. Uh, we are working very closely with our Department of Labor and Industrial Relations. Um, we uh, have been helping as many states have with uh, the UI calls that have come in, but we also have been working in getting eligibility documentation for dislocated workers um, that have eased and uh, facilitated access to, to our services. We've also, and uh, we may be a little bit behind on this, but we now allow for the use of electronic signatures, which I think broadens accessibility across the board. I would also have to mention that uh, in working with our partners at the Department of Labor, we have had the opportunity to ask for several waivers um, on certain things to um, to ease that access. So uh, that has been a great opportunity as well, is to be able to ask for, for some waivers for certain services at this time, um, some, some leeway, if you will, in um, some deadlines and, and some processes that, that help us uh, be able to serve more individuals uh, during this time. So on the next slide, I uh, wanted to talk a little bit about how we're addressing and working with staff and with customers, you know, it's been a real learning experience. I mean, um, I'm sure that we can all say that, you know, this is an unprecedented time and we have, um, we've really had um, some learning experiences from this process. And we knew right up front that in order for us to better serve our customers, we're gonna have to focus on our staff needs uh, first and as well through the process. Um, probably like a lot of other American job centers, we went through a period of time where we, frankly, at the very beginning, just were in shock and didn't do uh, anything until we figured out a plan. But when we got that plan, we started phasing our staff out to a virtual job setting, um, which of course brings its own challenges and sort of continuing to serve customers. We never stopped serving customers during this process, but we did phase out the staff out of the job centers and we are currently in the process of phasing those uh, staff, if you will, back into the job centers while we're still trying to provide those services to the customers. So in the process of phasing people out into the field, that did pose some interesting challenges and um, we had to provide um, a lot of technology for staff in order to be able to work virtually. 
we clearly have had to be very accommodative with work schedules. Um, you know, maybe in a way this this whole COVID-19 uh, pandemic has taught us that um, we need to think more flexible in a lot of different ways. And really that plays a lot into the message that 188 is trying to, to share is thinking differently and thinking outside the box. Uh, we've had to address ergonomic needs. Uh, we were on a phone call with field staff and we were talking about how we were gonna run out and provide earbuds for all of our staff so they could take calls for the customers that were calling in and, and someone spoke up and said, you know, uh, I, I have hearing aids. How am I supposed to, um, how am I supposed to uh, be able to serve the customer the best I can if you're passing out earbuds? Earbuds aren't gonna work for me. And it was a good learning experience for us to stop and say, wait a minute, we need to do something different so that we can accommodate our staff. Um, we uh, are in the process as we phase back in of providing PPE equipment for our staff and for our customers uh, in the way in the way of masks, for example, if they choose to wear them. But we've had staff. You know, um, I get anxious if I have to have a mask on my face. What what do I have to wear a mask? So we have had to partner and work with our HR department to make sure that those who are uncomfortable with masks, how do we work with that person to make sure that they're still able to serve a customer in a job center, but also to feel comfortable in their work environment. Um, one of the things that uh, we've done that I'm sure many agencies have done is that we have uh, not only purchased uh, your typical PPE um, suggested mask, but we're purchasing the clear face, face mask so that both our job center staff and customers um, will have uh, the ability to uh, ensure that, that those with communication challenges have better access to services. So we're just looking at different ways that we can provide services to staff to help them better serve those, those customers. Along with that then, we also have to pivot and look at how we can better serve our customers. And I think it's just causing us to think differently. Um, we could not do this if we didn't continue to have that communication and access to our partners. And if you'll notice on the slide, I didn't say access to Voc Rehab. Now, Voc Rehab is one of those partners, but really it would, it would be wrong to not think beyond Voc Rehab and look at our Centers for Independent Living, our uh, Disability Council, uh, anyone, uh, our Family Support Division, any partner that can help us uh, better serve that customer and get guidance I can't begin to tell you how many things we've been able to share during this time with each other as partners that we didn't even know existed in the process. So I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that, that we continue to share and, and uh, communicate with one another. And we actually have uh, regular calls that include our partner staff along with our, all of our workforce board leadership to discuss what is going on, what are our partners doing, what are we doing? Um, one of the really neat things that I wanted to share with you, uh, and so simple, just things that, that, that can be done to, to broaden that access for customers. Um, a lot of our workforce boards are using Facebook uh, and the live part of Facebook to put on kind of virtual webinars or virtual um, classes. So we've got some job centers in Missouri that are doing things like resume, giving resume tips and things like that. We've got a job center that was doing a jobs report live session. So imagine my thrill to go on Facebook and see that those were closed captioned. And our Ozark region, I have to give them a shout out, down in Springfield was the first, the first uh, region that I saw do this. And so I saw the closed captioning on there and I immediately reached out to them and said, bravo to you for thinking to do that um, and thinking beyond just, you know, uh, what you perceive sometimes as a typical job seeker. And the, the workforce board director wrote me back and said that since they have done that captioning, their, their count on their social media has increased. And it was just that simple, simple thing that made a huge difference. And so it, it's thinking, beyond you know the usual way that's been that's been helpful for us so next slide i want to talk 
a little bit about what we have done beyond COVID, so before COVID and, and beyond COVID, to, to really embody, I hope, Section 188 and serve our staff uh, needs and accommodations. And I just wanted to share that it really takes a team of people. You're never alone. I am a manager. I do supervise. I oversee staff. And so I know that it can be lonely sometimes, uh, if you would be honest with you, to fully um, understand everything, keep it all straight. But the fact is we all have help. We have our EO offices that are located um, out in the field that can help with accommodations. We have our human resources. Sometimes we need to consult our legal counsel. And in my case, is even our building safety coordinators. We are housed in a eight story large state office building. The first access out of the building is on the fourth floor. We are on the eighth floor. And one of the things, for example, that we had to address is what happens when there's a fire drill or a tornado drill and a person with mobility issues uh, needs to adhere to that drill? What happens? Um, well, we have to have a conversation with our building safety of, of what the needs of individuals can be. That's just one example of how we, we are working um, to coordinate those efforts. The so next slide. So just, just wanted to give you a little bit of example of some of the things that we have, these are actual things that we have actually worked with in Missouri as far as accommodations. And I think that um, one of the most interesting and um, learning opportunities for us was we have hired an individual that utilizes a service dog. So um, what do you have to think of when you've got someone who is going to be entering the building and, and using a service dog? We found out that um, we, we had to make some accommodations to the workstation um, that the, the dog would, would uh, be housed at with the employee because of distractions and things like that. So we, we had to learn a lot um, in the process of making sure that it wasn't just as simple as, as saying, okay, you know, um, <laughs> go for it. There were some things that had to be done in order to make sure that um, that employee felt comfortable with the tools she was using as a service dog um, in her work environment. And of course, we have workstation accommodations we have made. Again, you have to make work schedule adjustments. We've, we've had an issue with parking exceptions. We have a ton of parking spaces that are for individuals with disabilities. But we have even had situations where if people leave during the day to go to a meeting and come back, they're all full. What do you do when, when you have a person with a disability and their parking space, um, a, a, an accessible parking space just isn't there because there are so many users of those spots. And so we had to come up with creative ways to uh, make sure that that individual could get back in the building and still have accessibility. So those kinds of things are just things that we, that we keep on our mind as, as we're working with individuals um, that we, you know, to make it a better working environment for them. And on the next slide, I won't go into de deep detail on this, but I did want to provide to you through the process of providing accommodations for staff with disabilities, I have learned that Missouri has a, even a, a, an extra helper. Um, this, is a, this is a program called the Workplace Possibilities Program, and it's actually provided by our insurance provider, and they uh, have come in and when we needed them and provided an independent consultant who does uh, accessibility uh, assessments, ergonomic assessments, assesses the workstation, talks to the employee, and then provides us with um, guidance and uh, assistance on the best type of accommodations we can provide to that individual. And so I provided this because I wanted to make sure that um, it's something you might check within your state to see if such a, such a uh, program exists as well. Next slide. And finally, I wanted to talk about what we're doing at the state wide level. I'm very proud of the fact, and frankly, I've wanted this to happen for many years, um, but finally in fall of last year, 
uh, Governor Parson uh, signed an executive order uh, uh, naming Missouri as a model employer. This initiative, there are many states that have such an initiative going on, but we have finally joined the ranks of that. I have the privilege of serving on a team of agency individuals, agency and other individuals that are working to um, purport the, the mission of our governor to see Missouri as a model employer for uh, not only all state, uh, not only other states, but also uh, businesses in Missouri. And so um, just a few things that we've done since October of last year is again, we are, we are officially deemed a model employer for Missouri businesses. We uh, are, we hold, uh, have held and will continue to hold a talent showcase, which is basically a reverse job fair for job seekers with disabilities. When that took place last fall, it was for state agencies only. And state agencies were mandated to go through training. HR staff was, were mandated to go through training in order to understand how to um, better interview, prepare, um, and hire and accommodate individuals with disabilities in the state workforce agency. And then finally, as we're moving through that Missouri model as a model employer initiative, the most recent development is that we are establishing what are called disability navigators, which will be at each state agency. And these individuals will be subject matter experts um, around uh, disability issues, but also be a liaison and a, uh, a contact for each state agency, which I think is frankly, very desperately needed. So I'm very proud of that. Next slide. And I will just conclude by saying that, um, you know, I think one of the best lessons I ever got when WIOA was signed into law is I had a supervisor who would constantly say, you got to remember the intent, Yvonne, you got to remember the intent. And I know we talk and we quote law and we talk about, you know, um, the regulations and those are so critical, but to me, what kind of drives me every day and helps guide me, and I hope guides our agency in our state, is that the intent of Section 188 is really to get us all to think differently and to think inclusively when we're interviewing, hiring, and supporting our staff needs and assisting our customers. Um, and like I said at the beginning, if COVID-19 has done anything in a positive way, it sure has open those doors of opportunity to think differently and maybe it will help us transfer those into um, better services for, um, well, all of our customers, but including our customers with disabilities. So with that, I'll turn it back over. Great, thank you, Yvonne. Uh, that's a wonderful way to end and a wonderful way to, to sum what we heard today and let's all take it with us. Can we please come go to the last slide? Uh, I wanna, on behalf of the LEAD Center, I wanna take this opportunity to thank uh, Jennifer Sheehy for her welcome and overview at the beginning of today's webinar and all three of our speakers, Jamie Robinson, Danielle Smith, and Yvonne Wright for really allowing us to learn from your on the ground experience and expertise and insights. Uh, when you uh, come to the LEAD Center to download the resources, uh, we do have many resources to help you. Uh, please take a moment as you exit today's webinar to complete our post-webinar survey. It will pop up in your web browser uh, and your feedback will help us with not only today's presentation, but also as we plan for future events. We will be leaving the webinar platform open. Uh, while we did not have time for questions and answers, we did see that you had submitted some and we want to give you some more time to do so. So we'll leave it open for the next five minutes. Please do enter your questions and we will answer them and along with posting the webinar archive, the slides and the transcript to the LEAD Center website, again, www leadcenter.org, we will have questions with answers. 
So again, thank you everybody for joining us on what Jennifer shared at the beginning and Jamie, Danielle, and Yvonne walked through. It's an opportunity to create access, equal opportunity uh, for all customers through all of our IOA partners. So thank you for joining us today and we look forward to uh, seeing you on future webinars.